This is going to be awkward because anybody who knows me knows I talk with my hands and I like to pace the room and look at people. So I'm going to do my best being glued here and uh, perhaps they can give me a handheld mic that you're going to use for questions that I can actually use. Set. So um, bear with me. And the title of this slide is Thriving on the Edge of Chaos and you're going to understand why. When um, I was asked to come and speak this last time, I was grateful and excited because there's been some changes and developments that I think really have been lost. I don't think we've done a good job of explaining to the TOC community how grounded what demand driven is in the basic principles of TOC. And in 2014, I keynoted and I believe that I brought that together, but I don't think that it's really understood. So I want to come back to that because we are living in chaotic times. Is there anybody who doesn't believe that? Okay. So not only do we have the challenges for our supply chains and our clients and our own businesses, we have global challenge. And it is simply the law of the universe that you either survive or you don't. And there's a good reason to understand extinction, even just from a business standpoint. And the level of extinction, whether you're a species or whether you're a business, is exponentially growing. So the opportunity that we have to come together either as community and definitely globally, whatever part TOC plays in that, it has to start with understanding it. Okay? So I think that the contribution that I hope we can make today is to understand what our journey looks like and how we came to that place where we understand complexity in a much different way than I understood it when I first read the goal. And the contribution that Ellie made for me, um, I read that book in 1986, it changed my life because it absolutely crystallized for me what I was experiencing and had experienced in business. Okay? And it became an absolute obsession. And if you ask any of my family, and since all of them got drug into this business with me, they know that it is still an obsession of mine. So let's get started. There's some key points. And I want to understand, I want to talk a little bit about our legacy. I want to talk about the four pillars of TOC and why they're critical. And I want to talk especially about using the power of I don't know. Because even though Ellie didn't verbalize that till very late in his life, that's always been me. I am terminally curious. I don't care once I know the answer. I only want to know what it is I don't know now. And so because of that, I'm never going to be rich. Okay? Because I don't chase anything that isn't interesting. And I got to tell you, making money requires that you market something like uh, slime and green soap and weird stuff. So not going to work for me. So with that, I also want to talk about the aha moment of complexity science, which happened very late in my TOC career. Because uh, I was talk looking at John, and we were talking about I said, oh, look, it's a fossil reunion. <laughs> and he said, yes, that was not meant. It was me. Not you. So the aha moment for me was when I discovered complex adaptive systems. And that explains everything that I had learned for 20 years. And it gave me a framework where I could actually explain and bridge. So these two things, I think, made the difference. And I'm going to try and explain it to you in a better way so that you can understand the journey that we've been on and how I think that needs can be met and we can impact and help ourselves and the rest of the world. So I know you know that there are four pillars of TOC, inherent simplicity, Every conflict can be removed. People are inherently good, but my favorite is the one that was said at the very end, and that is never say I know. And never say I know basically allows you, when I, I learned this in the late 90s, because when I started consulting, I used to think I had to have the answer, and I always had to be right. I don't know if anybody suffered from that in their early years. What I found later is that I didn't need to know the answer. I just need to know the question and a process that can help me lead them to give me the answer because there is no way you can have intuition about everything on the planet. And there is no way you'll have deeper intuition into your client's environment than they have. What they have is a barrier to communicate that intuition across the silos. And what we do is we bridge that. So saying you don't know 
and that every situation could be substantially improved changes the fact that TOC by definition cannot be static. And I believe that TOC today with LE gone has become very static. And I know that the one thing that irritated him and it irritates me to death is if I hear someone say, oh my, I can have the voice of God now. So, that's scary. Okay, so I can back up a little bit. This is good, I think. And uh, I forgot what I was doing, I scared myself. Um, hmm. No, TOC, oh, it, it, it is static, okay? You can't be static. So Ellie, if someone said, Ellie said, as their basis for their argument, I don't listen. And the minute I hear that, I don't listen. Because Ellie would have told you, don't, don't say that to me. What do you think? What do you know? Push the boundaries, do something. Don't look to me. And we can't look to him anymore, but we can look to some things. So I'm gonna tell you, the power that that gave me. Identify a giant. Identify the enormity of the area not addressed by the giant. And reality gives the signals that so much more can be done. And that reality is the current negatives, right? Get on the giant's shoulders, look through his eyes, see that perspective. Get the historic perspective. I'm going to tell you when I wrote uh, demand-driven performance. I went back and looked at a historic perspective and I started writing and I started Googling and I gave a draft to Chad Smith, my son, and he said, what mm, book do you think you're writing? And I said, he said, you're supposed to just make this metrics thing so everybody can do it. And I said, I have done that and it doesn't work. So I'm writing the book that needs to be written because what's the problem we lost sight of that people solved that we can't transfer to the world we live in today. And there are giants who knew the answers to many things and they got lost along the way. Other things supplanted them, but there's the bridges, okay? So if you identify the concept difference between the reality that was improved by the giant and then the area that's untouched or changed because we have a very changing world, then you have an opportunity for a true breakthrough solution. Identify the wrong assumptions, and conduct the full analysis and the core problem and then get to work. So I'm gonna to talk to us about our demand-driven journey and this is the, the old book. Um, I was sitting at a conference in, um, gosh, I think it was San Antonio. I think that was when you and I got in a truck and drove to see Del Ellie <laughs> with the other Ellie, that was hilarious. Anyway, that didn't go very well. But uh, I was sitting next to Ellie and we were doing a book signing and people kept bringing him this book, and he just handed it to me, and he says, it's not my book, it's Deborah's book. So it was pretty funny. <laughs> this is a book that I wrote in 1997, but it really got started in 1995. And for me, this has always been around, I believe the core conflict, always, wholly, fully, has been metrics. And I've been writing about it, and everything that's in that book is still true, unfortunately. However, there is a light shining on this that actually gives us a way out and a bridge. And the power of management accounting is so amazing and how it got lost is an interesting story. But it always comes down to that it appears to me that we get sidetracked by someone who takes over a solution, commercializes it, hard codes it, and then it can't change. And then we get stuck with it and that's our data systems today. And so the power of data is different than the power of information. We'll talk about that. So in 1998, so up until 1996, I quit working. I have a weird background. I worked for Deloitte. I'm a CPA. I have, um, was a VP of finance and operations for a publicly traded company. I was director of finance for the second largest division of the Clorox company. And then I went to the EMBA program, found the goal, fell off the turnip truck, ended up pursuing, um, trying to understand TOC, so I went to teaching. And I went to teaching at a university so I could get a grant, that's how I wrote that book. At the end of that book I said, this isn't solvable because I can't solve the cost conflict. And then Chad Smith came and went to work for the Goldratt Institute, Abram Goldratt Institute, and uh, 
He was worked for two years. He came home a year after, asked to t speak to my clients and he or my my students, and he showed me the very first all by itself cloud, conflict cloud. And I took a look at that and said, "Oh my God, come with me." I drug him down to a company that had been bugging me to consult with them because I put my students in um, companies as their senior seminar. And it was clear to me that I finally had a tool that could bridge this gap. And that's really what Measurement Nightmare is about. In Measurement Nightmare, there's one page where I said, I think this is what the future looks like. And it had every single application of a supply chain, from research and development all the way through ops, through marketing, sales, and ending in distribution. And I said, there are linkages and there are control points in each one of them, but I, don't, I think that has to be the solution. And I never looked at that book again, because after you write something, I can't stand to read it. We got the opportunity in 1998 because of a wonderful program that Ellie did that was the, uh, the satellite series. And somebody watched that. He mentioned the book. I got called to Ditch Witch. And what we learned there is the power of decoupling. Now, Ellie and I had a, an argument. I'm, or we didn't always agree, but always respected each other, and I have the deepest um, gratitude for him in my life. But one of the things that I said and Jim and I were talking about is, I didn't like the way TOC was approached. It was siloed. You want a holistic approach? You got the distribution solution, which is separate from the DBR solution, which is separate from the project management solution. And to me, that just that didn't make sense. It couldn't work. And what we found out with Ditch Witch is because they were fully vertically integrated, they had a 13-layer bill of material, and a 90-day order cycle to their distributors because they were forecast. If you want to get to a weak delivery, you have to decouple the variation from one set of operations from hitting the other. So that was really where we found out that for us, replenishment was an integral part of the signal that was needed for DBR to be able to set schedules and do true pull. And that's really where demand-driven got its roots. So we were on this rather than looking at distribution, and then distribution just became an extension of it. So at that point in time, what you're looking at is the results that we got from implementing that. And we could do that because they were pre-2000 Y2K. We had green screens. We could actually, they had programming staff. We could do stuff like that. And that became the basis for our next opportunity. I have been blessed with chasing vertically integrated supply chains who let me catch them. So when you look at this, this is a forest products company that has the largest forests in North America that are privately managed. Largest privately held forest company. All the way from trees to plywood to structural timber to um, beams to particle board. All right? Those are the results that we got. And what we learned there was the power of vertical integration, not to just hooking up the uh, links that I talked about, but hooking up those separate business units with entirely different uh, policies and work practices needed. Oh, going the wrong way. Then my good friend Carol Patak. Carol and I had been together. <laughs> Carol and I knew each other since the early 80s at Apex. Um, that's how we knew each other. She was the ERP, MRP expert, and that was well known, and Ellie and Ellie and Carol got together and wrote Necessary But Not Sufficient. And that got me excited. It was the only time I actually went on tour, and I only went on three tours and said, this isn't going to work. And we actually had, we had the Gardner Group with us, which is one of the reasons why I didn't think it would work either. So long story short, we didn't get those objectives, because from my understanding when I signed up for that, it was to get the attention of software companies, the giants who were controlling things, and have them make a connection to the problem that, they, that existed with them, and the fact that in this world today, we need technology. And without technology, you can't harness the power of real time. Does that make sense to everybody? And the more latency you have between knowledge to knowledge, the signal to the interpretation, the more variation. So that left us with an interesting dilemma. TOC software solutions um, and, DB, and simple DBR didn't meet our solution set criteria that we had been hard working at since 1997. And we developed them a long way. 
MRP2 and the new ERP precluded programming, so I was absolutely, I couldn't do what I did at Ditchwich, couldn't do what I did at Roseburg anymore. In 2004, we made a commitment that was very uh, controversial in our company. So we reinvented ourselves three times, this was the third time, and it cost me two partners because they did not want to commit to TOC, to um, software. And it, it's stupid because we should not have been in a software development company. That's not really our strength. But we knew exactly what we wanted, so we were able to start coding. So these are the perspective that I have on our learning. Our consulting firm has always focused on improving system flow to improve ROI. And that connection has been very clear to us from day one. We developed system solution sets because our early clients were vertically integrated. And that wasn't an accident. I only chase things I'm interested in, which doesn't always pay my bills, but certainly keeps me happy, all right? Practical solution sets required real-time visibility to relevant information for decision making. And that has been the key. And that's really the whole point of the work that I've been working on since day one. That relevant information rev revolves around system leverage points. Time, capacity, and stock buffers are linkages. And they connect those, um, those integration points and those leverage points. And they're interdependent and interconnected, and you cannot divorce them. And whether it's CCPM, it's time. Whether it's DBR, it's time. Stock is connected in between, and capacity for both DBR and CCPM is critical. Okay. On time, on spec, and on quantity are the right metrics for system flow. So if I'm looking at a tactical or an operation time frame, I have to be able to connect the relevant range to the right metric. There is a time for forecast. There is a time for financial measures. But it's in a strategic planning stage right to the tactical edge. And then you have got to get real and come down to a granular view of how flow happens. The more granular you understand the interconnections of the flow, the better you'll get at improving the process. So we start with a pretty big picture of, I'm going to say, a routing. And I'm talking about a routing from quote to cash. And as we learn, our indicators tell us where to focus to get better and make the routing more granular. And I'm not talking about just the routing of a product. I'm talking about the routing of information flow to become a product also. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Software is a necessary condition. You can't be practical, you can't be real time, and you can't have visibility in today's world. It's just, there's just too much data. And you certainly can't move into mainstream and large companies. So the theory of constraints, I tried to make it, uh, somebody said that you can't get it in a sentence. So here's my theory of constraints definition. It's a methodology and a set of processes to maximize a system's ROI equation by employing solutions that identify, exploit, and manage a system through its leverage points and their interactions with each other. And that's the best and most succinct I've been able to get in a lot of years. And then you go, well, yeah, but how do you do that? That's the key, right? That's where you know, the road and the rubber meet. So it's got to be practical. So what we found is that we went down a journey and a road, and we ran into something called complex adaptive systems. And they have very different rules. And they're different than just complexity. And they focus on strategic control points to capture relevant information. And a strategic control point is not just a leverage point. It is a place where I need to understand what's happening, what's the ramifications, and am I on plan or not? So am I on spec, on quantity, on time, or not? And if I'm not, why not? How do I get back on track? And what's the implication for my whole chain? So after we started coding, this company, Romac, is up here because they were the very first people who bit the bullet and put in what we call a, a true interpretation of DBR. In fact, it looks kind of like Ellie's old simulator. If you were to look at our software, I could, the whole idea of watching that back screen, that was Bible to me. And translating that into bite-sized pieces in an organization connects it. You can look at the results. This company is still a client of mine, and they, are, they do a yearly audit. That audit, we tighten the model parameters. 
they bought their competition out because in 2008, they're in, they make very large pipe fittings and connections. And um, they had one large major competitor in, in North America. And we told them, inventory is just a way to store time. So don't let any skilled people in the Pacific Northwest go. Drive your inventory down and just turn as fast as you can, drive those batches down. And then the minute the market will come back, all you have to do is bring those batches back up, bring your inventory back up. They did that in 2009. They uh, drove their competitor out of business. He couldn't come back fast enough, and they, they now own that market in themselves. Laterno Technologies was really where we learned how to put the whole puppy together. Because once you have the ability to operate hour to hour and day to day, you have to make a tactical reconciliation to your future strategy. How do you bring that SNOP portion of your one-year plan, your two-year plan, your three-year plan, your six-month plan into being and make it practical? How do you know where to invest and what to do? And we worked with them long enough to be able to make that feedback loop. So demand-driven performance was really written because of Laterno Technologies. This is what I know. Oh, totally that we took that knowledge and we proved to ourselves that visibility is the only thing that counts. If I give people visibility, I don't have to teach them anything. I don't have to do Kaizen events. I don't have to do lean events. I give them some tools, and they will do it themselves. They will innovate themselves. And if you take that visibility away, they will immediately fall back to the dark ages, which is why I want to go back and talk about that. They were bought by Joy Global. Joy Global came in, and in 20, um, 2010, they turned off R plus and DBR plus, and they lost the visibility. Same ERP system, same people, same products, same processes, and they immediately sunk back to the 60s in terms of on-time delivery. Their inventories bloomed. Their lead times went away. And if you need any more proof, that it is visibility to relevant information that keeps coherence, keeps synchronicity. I don't need any more proof than that. I've seen it before, but that was so dramatic. So we began sharing demand-driven. Um, in 2009, uh, maybe 2008, Chad said, you know, we've got something here, and everybody needs it. MR we need MRP. And Lean has flattened the bill. People want to lose that connection. You're trying to do a Kanban pull. Tack time is just a forecast. The whole thing is built on a house of sand. Because if you're not doing true demand pull, then no matter whether you're doing DBR or lean, you're not doing the right signal. So doing that demand pull and fixing MRP, looking through the eyes of the giant, it was great, but it's broken. Doesn't fit our world. I said, the person who knows the most about MRP is Carol. Why don't you two get together? They got so far together, he dropped me, and now he has a new old lady for a friend. So they are partners in Demand Driven Institute. But we built that in 2010. I told them, you just swapped one old lady for another. But since she's one of my good friends, I, I'm OK with it. That resulted in her being able to get them to write the rewrite of Orlikis. This is critical, because the last part of that book says, here's the future. Here's Demand Driven. Here's why MRP is broken. That made a huge difference. We got Unilever to work with us in 2011 and 2014. And the results were incredible. We were in Turkey. We were in Russia. We were, uh, did Canada. They closed the Canadian plant and moved it to the North American plant because they had so much capacity they could do it from there. It went away. Why did it go away? It went away because they have SAP and they did not want to have a bolt-on. We said, great. We went to Germany, talked to SAP, had a deal. They were even going to pay for it. And guess what broke the deal? In order to do the integration, they had to use Accenture because that is their SAP consultant. And Accenture wanted twice what SAP was going to pay them, or what they were going to pay SAP, which was about 20 times what we had invested to get this solution done for them. And at the last moment, they backed out on that. They turned this off, and they're in the same place they were before. But we decided that the whole key 
to moving this is the same idea that Necessary and Sufficient had, which is we got the attention of giants, we got the attention of somebody like SAP, who actually invited us over. We spent two weeks giving them the secrets. Ellie said to me one time, write everything you know. Put it all out there. They'll never be able to do it. I said, OK. And then they'll have to ask you about it. Well, they're doing it, and we'll talk about that in a minute. In 2013, or 2011, uh, I broke myself in half, and I couldn't move. I Zero gravity for eight weeks, and then walked like a, on little not moving your legs for another six weeks. So Chad said, since you get to lay there for a long time, why don't you write another book? I said, OK, be useful. And what I got was the Google aha moment. So when I've written those other books, you didn't have Google. This made life so easy. And what I found was complex adaptive systems. And I found a guy named John Holland, uh, a Nobel Prize winning physicist. And I found the Santa Fe Institute, which is an amalgam of all sciences coming together to understand complexity from a whole different level. And I found that biology had leapfrogged physics. And this changed everything because it showed me why what we had been doing worked. We didn't have any rules when we set this up. We just used the good thinking process tools, found the deal, found the assumptions, created the solution, did the implementation, and then used our buffers as parameters to say, ooh, this wrong, fix this, fix that, and start to shrink everything closer and closer together. Improvement cycle, very fast. What we found is that exploitation isn't really what we're about. We're about exploration. And innovation is a regular feature of a complex adaptive system. And your body is one, and the social organization is one, the whole world is one. It explains how stars are born, how embryos are formed. This is more a mechanism of exploitation, exploration than exploitation. And this is a quote from John. And I read that book three times. And it is not an easy book to read. And it is not business friendly. Nobody had converted it. So what I did is I basically took it and said, I know how to put this into words from what I understand in running with supply chains. So complex adaptive systems, why complex? Because it's all about nonlinearity. And the rules for a nonlinear system are, in many cases, the opposite of running a linear system. And that is how we've all been taught to think. It's how every system's set up. Okay. So if you don't understand the interdependencies, and you can't link them, and you can't make them visible, you can't manage a system. It'll get out of control. And once things get out of control, they get too far, they die. So if that's true that I have to understand the interdependencies, then that means that extreme sensitivity to very small initiating offense, lots of them, cause the bullwhip effect. So really what this is, is it translates right to what we know as supply chain is the bullwhip effect. And in my world, the bullwhip effect has been predicted, but 50% plus comes from the cost effect variation. Cost efficiency is as big a contributor to variation as the rest of um, MRP and forecast distortion. Okay. And if that's true, then disproportionate cause and effects, parts that cost 10 cents can stop a plane from being built. Okay. And uh, that's a quote out of our book. So why adaptive? And this is what I love the best. In order for a system to change or evolve, it has the ability to, do emer to emerge. Thinking people, thinking systems have emergence. You can't change a complex, airplane's very complex, tremendously complex, but you can't dive it into the water and have it become a submarine. You can be a runner, you can fall in the water and learn to swim, right? That's the difference between being able to understand something, reason it out, and change how you behave or your actions. So complexity isn't just the definition, it's your ability to learn and adapt. So to do that, I have to have a feedback mechanism. And the better I get at interpreting, the quicker I get the signal, the better I interpret the signal means the ability I have to learn and emerge. And that when you select triggers and responses and teach them correctly, what happens when something happens that's so massive we've never seen before? We end up in a place that's very difficult to get out of. Little things that we can learn on. 
So it's our ability to do this or a system that helps us do this that determines if we're going to thrive or not. So some key attributes and, uh, that we have about coherence. A system is only as good as its coherence. The more coherent a system is, the more in sync it is. And I, I like this because all of the subsystems, if they are lined up, you can walk across them. If they're not, you're falling through the cracks. And you can think of that as your variation, your whip, your delays. Okay. Boundaries are the practical limits of subsystems and the overall system. And that means that at every entry and exit to a boundary, there has to be alignment to information that we all agree is the priority and is critical. And if not, what's wrong and how do we fix it? The edge of chaos is the zone between equilibrium, which is we're doing OK, and chaos. And if you can ride that zone with a buffer, you don't want to fall into the late, too early, too late, too much, too little. Those are the edges of chaos. Then we go into nightmare and we start moving everything around. We slide too far and we die. Signals. This is the communication protocol. How do we all agree? Where will we all look? What do we all agree is relevant? And how do we all agree what we're going to do about it when we see it? If I have the interdependencies understood and I can teach it and learn from it, because when it went this way, I did this, it still went that way, I did this, ah, then I can emerge. Signal strength, the ability to say, how critical is this? Is this medium, hot, cold? What should I be working on today? Those definitions of those buffers give me that criticality. The, I need to be able to prioritize everything based on what's truly the most important thing to the market today. And that's that depend, demand pulse signal. And the feedback loop. Without it, I don't get better. Okay? So you watch things that um, you set up something, it gets to a stable status, and you don't have that feedback loop. You don't do that learning, you don't do that emergence. Or if you do it in one little area and it moves over here, you got to go do the whole thing over and chase it again. It has to be holistically connected. So when we look at an environment, we draw all the connections from quote to cash, and then we say, what can we get our hands around? And if we're not going to tackle the whole thing, at least let's get information places back and forth between them, knowing we're going to have to go there eventually. So the success factor that determines whether or not you're going to be, um, I'm going to say, adapting and thriving is your resilience. And I like this picture because it's something green growing in a really ugly spot. It just goes to show you the power of nature, right? So if you are resilient, if you're flexible and resilient, you got the best shot. And this is the key, coherence. So in 2015 and 2017, we basically made that feedback loop. So we basically, we have been working, there's only so fast that we could um, earn money to spend money on coding. And luckily we got venture capital 18 months ago. And that took the rate of our ability to take what we know and put it into information, put it into a model. All that we're talking about is a model. I need an information system that follows the good rules that allows me to model anything. And if I can build a good enough model with points I can learn from, I can make my model better and better and better. And that's the feedback loop system. Okay? So these are the things that we've been working on. And we're talking about prioritized share. Prioritized share, we had prioritized share of um, inventory going to different distribution centers. I've been focused on, we were focused on prioritized share of capacity going to different inventory SKUs, common capacity. How do I know what's the most highest priority thing today so I keep everything in the red zone rather than some way too much, way too little? Okay. And then 2018 through 2019, we have been working very hard on what we call demand-driven adaptive systems. And that is the ability to match SNOP, take it to the right relevant range, and bring it into what we call tactical DDSNOP, demand driven SOP, is that tactical reconciliation of what we planned versus what we got so we can fix the model. How to make that routine, how to make it understood. So I'm going to tell you something that is my opinion, and my opinion of why TOC has failed to be mainstream. 
And it's something that we talked about, I've been talking about since 2007. It kind of forced us out of the TOC ICO body of knowledge group for a while. There was some contention that we weren't TOC. And the truth is, everything we've done is truly based in just good thinking process tools. If you are going to move to mainstream, you must be able to bridge. You can't take something away from somebody and not give them something else. Ellie and I had this discussion about measures. I could give finance a metric that they could understand when to use their finance and when we have to face flow metrics. You have to be able to bridge MRP. You need it. There has to be that link to connect a bill of materials and routings and processes. But on top is the old view of MRP and then MPS and SNOP. Those are core business processes that no company can do without that's of any size and certainly publicly traded. On the bottom is the demand-driven view of that. And we stood on the shoulders of the giants of each of those people because they did something amazing, looked through the eyes and said, what's different today? And it's complexity. And if you can't give people a bridge to follow, they can't come. So demand-driven operating model is the middle between that whole boundaries and signals of all my operations from quote to cash and then that tactical reconciliation piece. And we're going for four effects. And the very first effect is to stop the MRP forecast distortion. And that's really what DDMRP is about. The second is end the supply continuity variation. And that's really what demand-driven scheduling and execution are about. And I'm talking about true DBR as we see real DBR, okay? Because I don't, the market is not the constraint in my companies. At some time, it'll always come internal. It just goes in and out and it's gonna be internal, whether it's um, a, a time or a product or a certain area, you're gonna have to deal with it. You have to be able to know it and keep it in control. If you can predict it, you can get ahead of it and keep it where you want it. But that is really, it is just basic good DBR with a lot of twists because they're totally connected. They're interdependent. You can't take them apart. Ending the cost flow conflict. Management induced variation, that's where it comes from. And that management induced variation is every bit as big as the supply distortion. Align strategy tactics and execution around the system flow to market demand. That is DDS and OP. That's my tactical reconciliation that says my model's got it, my model doesn't. Something changed here, something changed there. I brought in new technology, we've got new products, I have a threat in the market, I gotta answer it. This is a demand-driven operating model. And if you, so if you go and look in demand-driven, that's the core of it. And you can't do that without that. So you must have a solid model before you can even start to talk about moving into tactical reconciliation process improvement, and hooking to strategy. So the end result is ROI maximization. And this is a demand-driven institute slide that I liked, and I stole it, and I said, but you guys need to finish it because it needs to look like this. So it's visibility and thoughtware determine an organization's ability to adapt and improve flow. So what are we going? Every single one of these has a phase, and the bottom is where most companies sit. They're stuck there. And it's a lot of opportunity and a lot of variation. As I move up to DDAE2, what I'm talking about is I solve, I put in DDMRP. That's all I've done. I put a seawall between my supplier's variation and a seawall between my variation and my market. The next step is to put in those control points about all your variation. All those control points that link your organization up so that that demand pull signal is on track for everybody. I have an engineer to order client, then that engineer to order needs to know what's the longest leg of the product cycle of the product they're gonna make because I need to get that part made first so I can get it in first. If I don't know that, I'm gonna have a lot of distortion. Does that make sense to everybody? It's all about priority and signal. Now, with that black box around there, now I have DDOM, and now I can move to actually doing feedback improvement. Okay? And the minute it's up, you are in that loop. So this is what I want to talk to you about. Does everybody remember the days when we were part of Apex and we had our own TOC and it was, Apex was big and there was a charge and we were 
We were 50 times bigger than we are today and better known. Demand driven, we've been, this is a grassroots effort. Apex fought about demand driven, refused to let them in. Um, and it's literally the chapters that have insisted and drug it in. And why? Because there is, you don't want to cannibalize your product. Same problem we have with consulting firms, right? But this is what's happened. Um, demand driven has gone mainstream. It's one of the pillars now of the new supply chain in Apex. And that happened this year. And it's been slow coming. We thought it would happen sooner, but it's really there. And what I'm going to say is that is interesting because the other side of it is we've cracked the necessary but not sufficient. I want you to see the Demand Driven Institute certifies compliance software. Just These are only DDMRP. Now, you notice we're up there, and we also are on the bottom, R plus NetSuite. Um, we are built into NetSuite. So that's the fastest growing cloud-based uh, ERP system in the world today. And it's embraced demand driven. Okay? We, can, we're, we personally can hook to about 18 different software platforms today, including SAP. And SAP is about 60% of our install base globally. And I'm not talking about CMG, because this is DD Tech. And DD Tech is a, a global and has global channel partners now. The point of this slide is that we made certain that Demand Driven Institute is totally separate from us. We gave away what Ellie suggested years ago, just write everything, put it out there, and um, not worried about it because they're so far behind the curve, but what has it done? It's made Demand Driven mainstream. And this slide is up here because in 1978, after um, Orlicky came out in 1976, MRP was poised to take off. There were about 700 implementations around the world. There are 6,000 practitioners um, already taught and certified through demand-driven concepts around the globe, and that was um, from about four months ago. And there are 700 implementations of all of these companies in DDMRP. And that means it's going to take off and be adapted in a way that we haven't seen something happen in a very long time. So on the lighter side, I like this. Somebody showed me this last summer, and this is when I knew we'd cracked the bubble. So I was in um, France. We were in Germany. We were in Germany last, OK, yeah, at the Demand Driven Institute conference. And I was presenting. SAP's presenting. Uh, a lot of people are presenting. And SAP was there. And, and I actually had the person who we talked to five years ago. And I started saying, hey, you know, you guys don't have a demand-driven operating model. You've only got DDMRP. And he said to me, well, I'm not talking to you because you're our biggest competitor. And I thought, is that the most ridiculous thing in the world? Do you know how big we are? We are like seven people. So how do I become, how does that work? I thought, you're not going to talk to me. This is, this is when I actually went home and said, oh, my God, I can retire. <laughs> but I love this. Gardner Group and demand-driven, and it's actually in a magazine. So it tells you that the, the terms, at least, I don't trust that Gardner Group's got it right, but I do trust that the terms are there. So the opportunity for the TOC ICO community. There's a framework and tools, and they support the theory of constraints and its practitioners. And there's a demand-driven message, and it's resonating. And that's, there is a VUCA world, and I love this. I had to say, what in the heck is this? But Chad and Carol are responsible for this. It's volatile. Actually, they're not. This uh, comes out of a supply chain world. Uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So here you're stuck with all of these things. And this is the world. And none of it fits what we have coded in our software and our thinking. That's 1965. This is today. So it's pretty clear that you were in trouble. And this, I did a whole presentation on this that uh, Deloitte did, but this is really what the topple rate is. The topple rate is how quickly a company top falls from the top of a industry to the bottom, and it's increased by 6x. Does that make sense to you that we say it's a much more chaotic environment and it's obvious that the tools don't work? Okay. This is a quote. And this is what's driven. This, this message is what is coming from Demand Driven Institute. This is absolutely resonating with companies. Okay? They know it. And when we explain this, this coherence to flow, this is George Plazel, father of MRP. We know 
that this is true. And all it's saying is, hey, flow is the key to cash flow all the way through, the key to ROI. We know it, but we don't behave that way. Okay? This resonates with people. This is a, uh, when I laid down for a while, this is an a easy equation I came up with because I kept saying, you know, it's so, why can't we just make it simple? Everybody knows this. And it fits all of these requirements. It's a very simple equation. We can quantify flow. We can look at the way a company vital signs are. If you get too far out into those zones and you get your working capital and cash too far out of position, you go into the red zone of chaos. Okay? Flow and cost can be allies if we understand when and where they belong. So the whole key when I had the aha moment in 2011 is, I've been talking about it forever, but I didn't make it simple. So we simply stuck in visibility. Because when I looked back, what did we do at Laterno? What did we do everywhere? We gave people visibility to a place where they could all agree on what was the priority and what was the synchronization points and what was important to do. And the minute you do that, you bring all kinds of clarity. And it's a very simple explanation. Variability is defined as the summation of the difference between what I planned and what I actually got. That's all variation is. And if I have visibility to variation, I have an opportunity to do something about it. When variability goes down, flow goes up. When variability goes up, flow goes down. Nobody fights about that. But the key is visibility. And visibility is defined as relevant information for decision making at a minute by minute level, hour by hour level, weekly level, tactical monthly level. And when visibility goes up to the right things, variation goes down and then the whole connection becomes really clear. So the biggest question becomes how do we gain that visibility to relevant information? How do we get control over this VUCA world that we live in? And that's really where complex adaptive systems rules came back. So when I read that signals and boundaries, all I did was pick up and say, hey, the core problem area is right here. And that's what we're solving. And it took looking through a whole bunch of giant's eyes to get it to be as simple. It's taken me 25 years to make it this simple. So obviously I'm pretty doggone slow because it should have been easier. But on the top is, how to understand a system, and that's understand the interconnections. And that's why you cannot have a canned solution. I have engineer to order firms, engineer and assemble to order firms, assemble to order and make to stock firms, assemble to order and make to order with make to stock. Every single one of them has elements of a solution set you know you have to have, but it is the connections internally that you have to map. And I'll be sharing that um, at, the, at the workshop because the power of getting the design right, but I only need to get it so right, and I can start at a high granular level, and then as I work those, too much, too little, too early, too late, I can start to build the granularity down at the key points. I don't have to be uh, minute and correct and accurate at the whole system, but I need to be good here. And this is where thought work comes in. And the most important thing about this conflict core area is that demand-driven flow is about mapping those connections. Okay. Then this is where DDMRP comes in. In a world today, I want to keep a stable system. I have to break it into bite-sized pieces. If I break it into bite-sized pieces, I put in a stock buffer and a couple. If I'm talking about engineering or a connection to something that is information, I put in a time buffer. It's a decoupling point also. Now we're talking about the ability to leverage a system through its um, linkages and its control points. And a control point isn't always a bottleneck, but it can be. It's the enter and exit of a boundary and whatever I'm gonna schedule from. And then Paradian models, it's the tails. The rest of the information is garbage, focus on those tails. And that is really DDMRP, and together those things form a demand-driven operating model. Now you have to do tactical reconciliation. That tactical reconciliation means thoughtware again. So you begin and end with thoughtware. And I'm going to speed up here because I want to show you something. 
You need all of these things to have a demand room and operating model. And if you only have DDMRP, you are stuck. You can't improve. You can make a seawall. You can get to 95% on time, but you're not going to get better. And that's not the point. And the point is, TOC gives you that thoughtware. So TOC and a classic company in demand driven. If you want to see what a company did in eight months, come and see High Heat. Because this company's been with you guys since the beginning. And they have done everything. And see what this did for them by taking a company that really understands the foundation of TOC. The whole point I'm making about this slide is these guys only have a quarter of the solution set. If they only have a quarter of the solution set, they are at least three to five years away from a whole working model. We are the only people with a, a, a demand-driven accredited um, operating model in APM. The reason why I want, whoops, going the wrong way. So demand-driven mainstream equals TOC mainstream. And if you join me in my workshop, there's an offer for TOC practitioners to take that to the next level. If we can open our minds and then build the next level of solutions together. Thank you so much. Questions? I think I'm out of time. Thanks. No questions. You're right up against it. Well, you can ask me you can ask me questions in the workshop. All right. Thank you very much.